there's been a theme. At every iPad announcement for the last few years, we have incredible hardware, but we're missing the professional quality software to really put it to use. That has finally changed. Apple announced both Final Cut Pro and also Logic Pro for the iPads, as long as you have an M1 or newer. I've been editing with Final Cut for the last few weeks, so I'm gonna give you a tour of the interface, the usability, what the workflow is like to edit videos on your iPad. We'll talk about the value of Apple's new subscription model, and I'll let you know as a professional editor that's been using Final Cut Pro for years now, what do I really think of Final Cut Pro for the iPad? Let's take a look at what Final Cut for iPad does best, and that is quickly sorting through a lot of footage to make a quick edit. So we're traveling right now, which is kind of a perfect use case for this. We are in Spain and we went to Ronda the other day and made a cool little video. So I'll just show you how I'd quickly edit that. If you want to set up your timeline settings here, um, just so you know, automatic usually does get it right just based on whatever the settings of the first clip that you drop in are. So I'm going to leave it on that for today and hit continue. And as we import our footage, this is one of the things that's going to limit how I can actually use Final Cut for iPad, and it might be the same for you. It doesn't support external hard drives at the moment. So all of these clips are in my library, which is very convenient and quick to work with. They synced over iCloud, so they're already here, even though I shot them on my iPhone. But the downside is it takes up a lot of space on your iPad, so you're gonna need a very large iPad, and even then it will fill up, because these are creating duplicate copies of the videos inside of the library, as well as in my Photos folder. So you just have to be aware that it could get pretty big and you'll have to offload them when you're done editing. The interface is very familiar as a Final Cut editor on the Mac. It looks similar, but it, it is different. It's clearly optimized for touch. And I'll just show you how I would quickly go through and edit some of this. The easiest way is that you can just click on any of the, or I should say tap on any of the clips over here in the browser. And you can just grab these yellow handles and select the best part of it. And then you could just press, hold, and drag it into your timeline. That's kind of the most obvious way I think that most people would end up adding things, but there are more efficient ways. Apple's put some thought into this, so let's find another nice clip here. I could hit play, and then as it goes through, I could set an in point, wait till it's at the end of the good part, and set an out point. But there is a more efficient way to do that. There is a jog wheel, which you can activate up here, and then it appears over here on the right. Also, you can move it around if it's kind of like getting in your way, you can grab it and move it up and down. But this is a metaphor based off old hardware that video editors would use. And what I like about it is that it lets you scrub through with momentum. So you can kind of throw the footage around. If we find a longer clip here, as I go through, it's, you know, this is a 40 second clip, but I could go from beginning to end in just one second. So I can frame by frame, find the beginning of the movement here set an out point, then quickly flick through to the end. Where does the end? There we go. And I can set an out point. And now I've got my markers. And instead of clicking and dragging, tapping and dragging, which is always a little slower, I'm gonna use the append button here, which just drops it into the end of the timeline. This is the most useful way that I'm usually adding clips to the timeline. You could also insert them in between clips if that's something you want. But um, what I'm doing most of the time is appending. Another way you could edit is that you could say select, grab a bunch of clips, append them all into the timeline, and now they're all here, everything, including the parts that you don't want. And then you could go through and use some of these tools down below on the right here. These are things I use all the time on the Mac. So I could find um, the key moment here and use the blade tool. So that's gonna cut between my two clips. And then I can move the playhead again. And these two will trim everything from the beginning of the playhead. Then I wanna go from this wide shot to the close up here, trim everything from the beginning. And then I think I have another close up. Oh yeah, there it is. So I can use the blade tool and zoom in on what's going on here. This one will trim everything to the right. And because of the magnetic timeline, as I'm doing this, all the footage is just sucked together. It's very helpful for that. So let's say the magnetic timeline is not behaving the way you would expect. If you, for your example, drag a clip away and there is a gap, that is because you have the position tool on. This is helpful. This tool can do a lot of things, but the kind of default behavior is to have it off. So just be aware 
If that becomes purple, then you might be using an alternate method of editing. I find a lot of people run into that on the Mac as well. And one more way of editing, this is actually gonna be a really useful tool for anybody that wants to do a bit more of a pro workflow going from the iPad to the Mac, is that as you select these in and out points as you go, instead of dragging them into the timeline, you can also add favorites and see how this becomes green, both in the browser and in this preview of the clip. That means that it's been favorited. So I'm gonna quickly go through, grab a few uh, random favorite moments. And the power of this favoriting tool is that it's um, useful later. So if you just add things to the timeline, it's kind of hard to go back and find those clips that you liked uh, to you know sort of sort them in different ways. But as you can see, when we create favorites here, now I'm able to sort them using this little sorting tool. There's various ways you can sort it by media type or favorites, show favorited. And now look, we only have those moments. It's just the part of the clip that we asked for. So I'm gonna clear out my whole timeline here, just delete everything I've done, grab all of these clips, append, and now I almost have like a little edited video because since it's only the good parts as it plays back, it'll almost be slightly edited. Then all you'll have to do later is sort of trim them, tighten them up, but that metadata is retained as you move the project onto the Mac. So you could have one editor selecting their favorites and then another editor doing the final edit on the Mac. With the iPad being so portable, I think one of the biggest advantages will be this sort of quick and dirty type of edit when you're like on the go. I made a little either Instagram reel or TikTok a vertical video that can show you as an example. I think this is gonna be something it's very strong for. So this was kind of a perfect editing scenario for traveling because my iPad is a small device. I can carry it with me. And it already had all of the footage from my iPhone that I'd been shooting so it synced over iCloud. So I didn't even have to airdrop or transfer it in any way. It was just already available. Only took a few minutes to put this together. And as you can see, it's using that dynamic music, which I hope this feature starts getting a larger library. But as you stretch it, the music just becomes the length that you want it to be. I mean, this can be 10 minutes long if you want. I would love for other third-party developers to be able to add music to this. I know it's possible, so please, Apple. Uh, they did say that more effects will be coming soon from third parties, so I can't wait to see that. Uh, there's some good ones in here, but I think we could especially see more from Motion VFX. I use those all the time on the Mac. One really cool new effect is scene removal mask, and I was hoping to do it on this clip so that she would be over top of the title. Unfortunately, you just have to be aware that it needs to be used on a clip where there's no motion in it. So um, the background should stay static where just the subject is moving. I don't have an example of that. I'm moving all the time in all my clips, so I wasn't really able to test that one. So all these things are what I think Final Cut does great on the iPad. Here's a few that it falls a bit flat. Uh, so this is footage from either my traditional bigger cameras that I'd use in YouTube videos or drones. And um, when I say flat, let me show you what I mean. So I've selected this clip. I'm gonna open up the inspector. And over here, there are some basic LUT tools. So I can say that this was shot in Canon Log 2. If I turn that off, you can see it's a completely flat image. Like there's you know, no saturation, no uh, contrast in it. If I turn on log processing, it does know that this is Canon okay, right? So there's contrast here. This, this doesn't look good. This is not how I would typically color grade my footage. Basically, all professional cameras are gonna be shooting in log, so the lack of proper log support is unfortunate. It does mean there's gonna be some limitations of the type of footage I can work with on the iPad. If you are gonna be doing color grading, you're gonna be needing to look at something like DaVinci Resolve, which has all of its color tools in here, which is actually insane that they were able to do so much, but it's, act, it's editor, like the way you cut footage together in Resolve, I really, I don't, I don't like it. I mean, I find it much, much stronger uh, over in Final Cut Pro. So this is what I'd use for editing, whereas Resolve has those color grading tools. Oh, and while I'm talking about things I miss from the Mac, one other one, if I drop this drone shot in here, is I really wish it had all of the speed ramping tools that the Mac has. So in my inspector over here, I am able to just turn up the speed of that clip, but on the Mac, I was able to add speed ramping. So I'd be like, okay, this first part, I want to be uh, really quick and then I want to slow down gradually. Here, I could cut it and then instantly it slows down and speeds up, but it's just not nearly as elegant as the way that it happens on the Mac. So this has always been an advantage of Final Cut over the other editors. Let me play it back for you here. 
but now it is just kind of more similar to what you're seeing on other software. I didn't do a great job there, but that's what I'm saying. Speed ramping, I hope they match the features that are available on the Mac for that. And obviously another big difference from the Mac is that it is now subscription when you are using a Final Cut for iPad. I don't love subscriptions, um, not ideal, but the pricing is pretty reasonable. $5 a month or $49 a year. So for example, I paid $300 for Final Cut Pro for the Mac. It would take about six years to pay that much here. I really hope this means that more support is coming for Final Cut, that updates will happen often. Because for example, with Adobe, if you just want Premiere, you're spending $20 a month. That's four times as much but you're getting updates all the time. Adobe has re been really aggressive with their updates. For reference though, you can get a free copy of Resolve. So that's where Final Cut sits, basically in the middle. Uh, Adobe products are much more expensive. Final Cut's a lower priced subscription and Resolve starts off free and then you can also do a one-time payment to own it. So let's take a look at a more complete edit here back to our day trip to Rhonda. Um, one feature I love, because I used to try to do this on the Mac uh, and there was no easy way. So I'd actually do screen recordings of my iPad, then put it over top and that's live drawing. So here I'll delete this one I did before, show you again. Unfortunately, I don't have great handwriting. So you're just gonna have to bear with me. If I had an Apple pencil with me, I'm sure it'd look a little bit better, but I'm just gonna do my best here. What it would really be useful for is actually arrows, like pointing at things or highlighting features on the screen. I'm gonna use it for that all the time. And as it plays back, you can also change the speed. So let's see. Oh, that fits actually perfectly inside of that clip, but uh, in other examples, it may not. You can open the in inspector and over here, say how long do I want it to take to draw? So I could have it be much, much quicker, let's say, and then just takes a moment for it to appear on screen. All this footage that I'm scrubbing through, by the way, this is 4K footage uh, running on an M2 iPad Pro. Playback is perfectly smooth and it's at higher quality. You can set that quality, by the way. Uh, so right now it's playing at high quality. You could also have performance if it was slowing down a little bit. It also supports uh, video scopes, just like you're used to on the Mac, the waveforms and vector scope, all the things that you may need for color grading. Hopefully better color tools come at some point. By the way, let's actually look at those just really quickly. If I pick a clip, uh, do any of these need it? So if I want to actually modify these colors, let's look at what those are. I can open up the inspector here, add effects, and I'm going to use color adjustments. Now at first glance, it seems like there's a lot of power in here. I'm gonna turn off the browser so I can see this bigger. Unfortunately, the footage just doesn't respond in the way I'd want it to. Like moving the exposure, it instantly clips. It doesn't seem to understand that exposure is mostly about the midtones. Brightness has a bit more of that effect, but it also has a weird response on the kind of saturation in the shadows. This is not a great color grading tool. I would expect more power out of it than this. Of course, there's more tools than I had time to get to in here, um, a lot going on, and eventually I'll get to all of it. I still have to understand some of it myself, but there's also things like multicam support. I didn't have any multicam footage to work with on this example. Uh, the volume is always available, so you can turn your clips up and down. Remember to close it. Sometimes I'd find that uh, the behavior wasn't as expected, but it's because I left my volume panel open. Over here in options, you can change the appearance of the timeline, like clip height. This is kind of important to play with. Your audio meters can be turned on and off, which are visible. On the right, uh, snapping, I generally have this on so that clips click together. And that is your whirlwind tour of Final Cut Pro for iPad. I've been a Final Cut editor for years now, starting with seven, and then I was at the announcement of Final Cut Pro 10 at NAB back in 2011, and I've loved it. It is a fantastic workflow. I use it for our professional work and for YouTube. It's extremely fast and thoughtfully designed, and it's hard for me when I switch over to either Resolve or Premiere because Apple had a real breakthrough with the magnetic timeline, and I just, I prefer it over everything else. Final Cut Pro for iPad is missing some big things, things that are important to me in just my daily workflow. They're not even that advanced, like file management. All you can do is keep all of your clips inside the library on the iPad, and you can move that library to a Mac to do further editing. It doesn't go backwards. You can't bring it from the Mac to the iPad, but a real limitation is that you're not using any external storage, meaning all the files have to be on an iPad. So I know that Apple's doing this for ease of use. It's much easier for a beginner user to understand, but it means that my iPad is gonna fill up quickly. So you're gonna need a really big one. And even if it's big, you're gonna have to be moving files on and off of it somehow. I'm not sure how they would expect 
file management to work if you edited a lot on the iPad. Probably my other biggest disappointment is the lack of color management in general. Of course, this can come in the future. Basic things like LUT support, which is available in other editors like CapCut or LumaFusion. And this is a problem because whenever I record on bigger cameras, like this is the Lumix S52X, I record in log. So the image is completely flat and needs a lot added to it to even be usable. And I don't plan to switch away from not using logs. So to me, what I'd be editing the most often on an iPad is iPhone footage, which is a thing. That's what I was doing today. It looked great, but it's a more limited use case than when I'm on the Mac. But you know what? Overall, I think Apple has done some amazing things here. This is the best video editing interface I've used on an iPad. I've tried to get used to LumaFusion, it has every feature you want. I know people do real jobs using it, but the interface is horrifying. It does not look nice. It doesn't feel good to be in there. It's very clunky and, and hard to get used to. Other apps like Resolve, which they did an amazing job of bringing almost like the full app onto the iPad, but it's almost a one-to-one -one transfer of Resolve for the desktop. I really like that Apple thought through the touch interfaces. How would you want to experience an app on the iPad? and it shows. It is much more intuitive than any of those other editors. So if you don't have a lot of files to manage, you're not doing extensive color grading, you don't need big effects, Final Cut Pro is the best editor for iPad. Oh!